name is Andy Signori. I'm with Corporate Engineering. And I wonder if the progression of events that uh, we've seen in Great Britain is a um, progression that we'll necessarily see in the United States, and what your opinion is on that. We will not necessarily see it, but we are highly likely to see it, unless we change course. The progression of events in Great Britain is exactly the progression of events in the United States, except at an earlier date. That is, Britain has been a leader in this respect. And we have been following with an interval of about 15 to 20 years. Now, of course, in some ways, some places, we've speeded ahead. For example, in respect to the matters I've been talking about today in the control of drugs, we have gone much farther in detailed regulation of drugs than Britain has. But in other respects, we're much farther behind them. Thank God for small favors. <laughs> But if we continue down the path we have been going on for these past 40 years, we shall end up where Britain seems to be headed. Yes. Thank you. I'm Jean-Paul Valence. As you can tell, I learn English in a state-sponsored <laughs> university. <laughs> <laughs> My question is uh, regarding the so-called energy problem. Uh, there are a lot of solutions that have been proposed. None of them are very simple, like I s suspect you would propose, mainly to uh, let the uh, free market determine the price of various type of uh, energy. And uh, what uh, do you think of the uh, latest Carter proposal uh, with this respect? Well, as you know, that's another case of a set of measures which in part are supposed to protect the consumer. Because uh, in the whole energy area, uh, it's, uh, uh, I didn't go into it because it uh, uh, just duplicates what we've seen elsewhere. The real problems in energy in the United States date back to 1954, 23 years ago, at which time, because of a Supreme Court decision in the so-called Phillips case, the Federal Power Commission was more or less instructed by the courts to set a maximum price at which natural gas could be sold. Now, for a while, for quite a long while, that had no great, that imposed no great uh, problem. A maximum price doesn't have any effect unless the price is less than it otherwise would be. And for quite a long time, you were in a period where energy prices were going down. You did not have substantial inflation, so that maximum price was largely ineffective. But after a while, that maximum price began to bite. And when the maximum price began to bite, what did it do? It made it less economical to produce gas. It made it more economical to use gas. It stimulated consumption, and it retarded production. Now, even so, that might not have been itself a disastrous thing, except that when Mr. Nixon, in the most, in my opinion, harmful thing he did in the whole of his administration, far more harmful than the much more publicized Watergate scandals, when he imposed price and wage controls in August 15, 1971, when he simultaneously put controls on domestic prices and free took off controls from foreign exchange, when his left hand did not know what his right hand was doing, uh, that produced, that spread the damage from gas to oil. Because now you set a ceiling on the price of, nan of oil, of crude oil. And that ceiling on the price of crude oil started to have the same effect as the ceiling on the price of natural gas to encourage consumption and discourage production. And that is the ultimate source of the whole energy problem. It has nothing to do with, our running, with the world running out of oil. It provided the OPEC cartel with their opportunity uh, they might still have tried to get away with it in, in the absence of it, but they wouldn't have been as able to get away with it. And almost everything that has come from that has emerged from those initial acts of regulating the price. Now, all of this, as I say, when you hear the people in Washington who talk about this, as I heard Senator Henry Jackson on TV the, uh, just yesterday talking about this and talking about the, whether the price of natural gas was going to be deregulated. Oh, no, it'll cost, he said, the American people $10 billion to deregulate gas. 
No, that is utter nonsense. It has cost the American people a tremendous sum to have regulated it. Will you tell me how any person is benefited by not being able to buy natural gas and being forced to use coal instead? Or being, having to use much more expensive oil than coal? Will you tell me how anybody is benefited by natural gas not being available for industry and therefore he doesn't have a job? But, no, Henry Jackson is a friend of the consumer and he is going to see to it that the homeowner isn't hurt. And the tendency, therefore, in the energy program for exactly that kind of reason is that if you look at all of the measures that are proposed in that energy program, they are measures that are designed to make the costs imposed on the consumer by the program invisible. Price control is going to be kept. Gas is going to be restricted to household use and visible use. But the utilities are going to be required at almost whatever cost to convert to coal. Factories are going to be prevented from using coal. If not, they're going to, I mean oil. They're going to be required to use coal. If not, they're going to be, uh, uh, they're going to be required to uh, uh, pay a very high tax. The effect of that will be to make energy more expensive than it otherwise need be, to lead to a wasteful use of energy, to make the cost come out to the consumer in the form of the prices of the products he buys, rather than in the direct price that he pays at the gas pump. But it'll also come out at the gas pump. And part of the effect, of course, is to strengthen the power of OPEC to control the price of oil. The effect of these measures, since the Federal Energy Administration was established in order to protect the Americans' uh, oil supply from, foreign, uh, from the foreign OPEC effect. Since it was established with the objective of increasing domestic availability of oil and gas, what has happened? Our imports of oil from abroad have been going up very rapidly as a percentage of total energy consumption. Why? Because the effect of the oil, and a complicated thing that I can't go into here through an enti so-called entitlements program, the effect of our present oil price program is to give a subsidy of $3 a barrel to every barrel of oil imported from abroad. And again, who's paying for it? The consumer's paying for it one way or another. He may not pay for it directly. He may pay for it indirectly in taxes. In my opinion, if you had not had these perverse governmental measures over the last 10 years, well, really, since 1971, primarily, the OPEC cartel would be gone by now. It would have collapsed as other cartels have collapsed. But we've shorted up. And the Carter Energy Program, I think, will be an utter disaster. You know, it's absolutely hilarious if it weren't so serious. In order to, in order to protect the American consumer against the cost of energy, we establish a Department of Energy whose annual budget is greater than the total cost of all the oil we are importing from Saudi Arabia. <laughs> That's how you, the consumer, are protected against being exploited by those big bad oil companies. So I think the energy program is a disaster. We have a gentleman here who... Dr. Friedman, I'm Terry Sanders. Since we don't seem to have learned a great deal uh, in the last 90 years, uh, what do you think the prospect is for doing better? Uh, in other words, uh, how, how do we go about uh, getting uh, a freer enterprise system, uh, particularly in view of our pretty bad record in recent decades? That's a very good question, and I wish I had an easy answer to you, but I don't. I don't see any other way than to do, as we always try to do, to persuade one another to try to operate through public opinion to try to operate through influencing our representatives in Washington. After all, again, as I was saying before, it's not from, as, as Adam Smith said, it's not from benevolence that we get our daily bread. And it's not from malevolence that we get the bad laws. If, if the representatives in Washington vote these bad laws, it's because it's in their own self-interest to vote them. And it's in their own self-interest to vote them because it has been pro proved to be a way in which they can get elected. Ultimately, the Congress is going to do what we the people ask them to do. And it's ultimately because we the people have been misled on these matters. Because we have thought that the way to solve problems was to turn to Washington, that Washington has been ever ready to try to undertake an answer to those problems. 
So I don't see any long-run answer other than public understanding and public recognition of the problem. In this area, I see some good signs. I think the public is becoming increasingly uh, disillusioned with government. I think that there is a widespread feeling around the country that maybe throwing money at a problem isn't always a way to solve it. And I may say, if I may, speaking here in this great city of New York, that I think few things have done more to promote a healthy understanding of the problems of over-government than what has happened in New York City. We all thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Friedman, uh, I'm Joe Capo, and possibly you have already answered part of the question that uh, I was going to put to you. Do you have any particular advice for the individual consumer's action on the basis of these TV programs that you're embarking on? Well, uh, the question is, what advice is there for the individual consumer? And the best advice is to be beware of confidence men of all kind in whatever guise they come. <laughs> Whether they come to you as St. Ralph, <laughs> <laughs> or as Mr. Clean. <laughs> Beyond that, in your question, I think there are, uh, there is very little that there is to be said uh, to the cons about the consumer. You know, most of us are pretty good at protecting our own interests. I think that there's a strong te tendency to denigrate how sensible people are in protecting their self-interest in the narrow sense as consumers. And indeed, you know, while much of the rhetoric is pro-consumer, the substance is often anti-consumer in the sense that what the so-called consumer advocates are really after is to, make, is to make the consumer behave as the advocate believes he ought to behave rather than as a consumer himself really desires. It's in that sense that they want to protect the consumer. It's in the sense of saying, I know better than you what's good for you. And in your own self-interest, you're going to have to do it. So I think that as consumers, we're pretty good, if you leave us alone. But I think in our role as citizens, we're terrible. And for the same reason. If you're going to buy something every day, it pays you to look into what, whether that's good or bad. If you're going to deal with a grocer you better look, daily, you better be pretty sure that he's a reasonably reliable grocer and that you'll get what you order and that he won't short weight you or shortchange you. But if you're going to have to vote once a year, on what? On a long, long list of propositions? Very little relationship between your vote and what ultimately comes out? How much time does it pay you to inform yourself about that? It's just a waste of time and energy. You can, you're not going to influence anything. So it's understandable, in my opinion, why the individual is far better as a consumer in his private capacity than he is as a citizen in his public capacity. And what we have to do from that point of view is to drive home that lesson and make individuals recognize the enormous importance of setting a limit to the powers that we grant to the government. To, we cannot do it on a case-by-case -case basis unless we can do it on an overall basis. And there are various ways of doing this through tax limitation amendments, through other things. I think we won't succeed. Hi, I'm Steve Love from Pharmaceuticals. I'd like to know how you feel about the uh, Laetrile question. It seems to me that that's a, uh, possibly a classic example of the consumer not really being in a position to make, his, uh, make the proper uh, choices and seemingly making the improper choice. That's a very good question, and I'm delighted you, you asked that because it's the first question that has really been related to the talk. And we're getting... <laughs> so you get a special gold medal. And we're getting close to the end of the time when we ought to be shutting this off, but we'll get to you. Uh, first of all, I believe that the FDA or any other government agency ought to publish and make available any information it has on Laetrile. My feeling on Laetrile is exactly the same as my feeling on everything else. I think that the consumer ought to be free to make his own judgment. I have no idea whether Laetrile is a useless uh, uh, substance derived from apricot pits or whether it's the greatest boon to mankind. I have no idea, no judgment on it. But I believe that if I were in the situation of a terminal cancer patient or a not so terminal cancer patient, that I ought to have freedom to choose whether I wanted to be 
on Laetrile or not. Now, Laetrile is a very, very interesting case because, so far as I know, neither the FDA nor anybody else has said that Laetrile does any harm. The argument against Laetrile is that the harm which it does is to prevent the patient from seeking more effective cures. But there are no more effective cures. If there were really a truly effective cure, I don't think there'd be much of a problem. Now, there may be better or worse cures. I'm not saying there aren't. I'm not saying that it isn't better for some people to do something other than lateral. I'm not making that judgment. I'm saying that I don't believe that some people sitting in Washington ought to be able to make that judgment for me. That's my business. I belong to me, not to them. It's my life at stake. And if I choose to risk my life, if I choose to walk across the street out here, should I be, uh, should I be free to do it? I'm risking my life. If I choose to take Laetrile rather than something else, that's my business. Now, of course I'm not well informed. Who is? If the information were really clear and unambiguous, publishing it would be enough, and even that wouldn't do the trick. The information on tobacco, on the effect of cigarette smoking on lung cancer and on other diseases, is, is in my opinion, decisive. In fact, it was strong enough 20 years ago to lead me to give up smoking. And as, so far as I know, the evidence since then has only become stronger. The people who smoke know that. And if they choose deliberately to take the chance of killing themselves through smoking because the satisfaction that they get from the smoking is worth it, that's their business. I don't see that it's any business of mine to stop them. And similarly, so far as Laetrile is concerned, I believe that you ought to have the completely free sale, not only of Laetrile, but you see, I'm much more extreme and much more radical. I am in favor of the free and open sale of all drugs, whatever they may be, including heroin, including, uh, more, uh, including the addictive drugs. Not because I think they're good for you. Far from it. Not because I think that they don't do tremendous harm to people who take them. But on the one ground, because I believe we have no right to stop people from doing it, and on the other, because if you look at the evidence, the costs of prohibiting them are greater than the costs of permitting them. Most of the harm which is done by hard drugs is done because they are illegal. It's done because the illegality, the fact that they are illegal, causes them to be extremely expensive. It provides monopoly. You know, it's a very interesting example of the same thing we've been talking about, about regulation. The effect of making heroin and other drugs illegal is to provide a monopoly position for those people who are able to supply them. You can't just have free competition in that area. As a result, this leads to the fact that the, that the man who is in a position to sell heroin has an economic incentive to, to produce addicts, to invest capital in producing an addict because he'll have a tied customer, a customer who is tied to him. But it means also that the customer is driven to steal. He is driven to illegal activity in order to support his habit. And I believe that the evidence is overwhelming. If you want to see that evidence, just look at the experience of alcoholic prohibition, which is identically the same thing. After all, alcohol is an addictive drug. There's no difference in principle between alcohol and any of these others. And if you look at our experience through prohibition and trying to stop alcohol, you can see that rendering it illegal did far more harm than the harm which was done by its, its legality. So I don't have any difficulty on the Laetrile question. Professor Friedman, my name is Linda Strube, and I'd like to ask you your opinion on the subject of product safety and the insurance that's required because of it. What has been the effect on the small business and people's ability to get into and succeed as a small business? That's a very good question and a very pertinent one because there's no doubt that one of the side effects of all manners of governmental regulation, and not merely the one you're talking about, has been adverse in general to the small business. Not entirely. There's one advantage the small business has as a result of regulation. It's much easier for the small business to engage in illegal activities than it is for the big one. 
But outside of that dubious advantage, most of these measures discriminate against the small businessman. It's much more expensive. First of all, the expense of, expense of conforming to these various regulations, whether you talk about OSHA, that is the Office of Safety and Health Administration, whether you talk about withholding taxes, wherever you go, there are certain costs involved that are more or less independent of the size of the business. And they're more easily borne by a big business than a small business. A big business can more easily defend itself legally and so on. So all of these measures do have a very adverse effect on small business. Now, in respect to the particular item of so-called uh, standards, safety standards and, and, and uh, in insurance against it, we have had a very dramatic shift over the past 10 or so years, almost from a doctrine of caveat emptor, buyer beware, under which it was assumed that the seller was liable only in case of proven negligence, to a situation which is almost vendor emptor, seller beware, in which the seller is assumed guilty unless proved innocent. And it's extremely difficult to prove him innocent. Now, the effect of that is going to be, as you were quite properly saying, to require a very much more costly process of producing products which have any chance of leading to damage suits. Now, from this point of view, uh, the safety products requirements of the sa one of those four letter uh, combinations I gave at the beginning of the talk was a safety agency. I've forgotten which combination of letters it is. But uh, uh, one of, from that point of view, one of the effects of their putting out standards may be in a way to help the small business. Because if a small business can show that it conformed to the government standards, it may have no liability for damage which is done. So the effects on business, as always, are generally very mixed. The main person who, is, who will have to bear an extra cost, in this as the other case, is the consumers. The consumers will have to pay for this. Now, there's no reason why they shouldn't if they want to. But you see, each of us could do it voluntarily on that kind of thing. We could each buy insurance for ourselves against a variety of defects. Again, should we be compelled to buy it whether we want to or not? That's the fundamental issue. The argument for all of these measures, whether it be FDA, whether it be the safety products, that has the most merit, and which is the hardest to meet, is the argument from involuntary exposure. Now there, there is a real problem, a real issue. With respect to items like laetrile, saccharin, heroin, it seems to me the case is crystal clear. I can choose. But now, if a factory is emitting a noxious substance in the air, and I'm walking in the neighborhood or driving a car in the neighborhood, I am involuntarily exposed to a cost. And there, I cannot choose. And there, I really do have a dilemma, because there is no good way to answer, handle that. It's not a good way to handle it through simply doing nothing about it. It's not a good way to handle it. Well, in many cases, if the damage is capable of being severe, it is properly handled by our present laws of responsibility, or our former ones, because then the person who is injured can bring suit and recover, and that makes it, that internalizes the cost in the economist jargon, that is, it makes it in the self-interest of the company to avoid such things. But if the effect is a small, widely dispersed one, like the effects of emissions from car exhaust. It is very difficult to identify who's done the harm to you and therefore to collect from it. And there is no good answer to that question. That's the only case in which I would recognize that one could establish a case at times for governmental intervention. But even there, I would say, almost always, you will find that the right kind of intervention is not to set standards, but to impose costs, not to set requirements on the kind of emission control a car has to have, but to impose a tax proportional to the amount of emissions that come out. And similarly, in the case that you're describing. I think we'll, we'll have to make this the very last question. Uh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. You go ahead. 
Uh, yes, Dr. Friedman, in view of your philosophy, where do you stand on patents, trademarks, and uh, copyrights? Well, on the whole, those are, again, you know, there are easy questions and hard questions, and those are hard questions. They're like the case of the involuntary exposure. There's an argument for patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Trademarks are really in a little different position than patents and copyrights. And let me stick to patents and copyrights for a moment. There's an argument for patents and copyrights. After all, if I produce a new product, in order for me to have an incentive to do it, I have to be able to capture some of the gains. If once I've produced it, anybody can imitate it, how do I capture the gains? So in a way, you can interpret patents as part of what is an essential function of a society, which is to define property rights. And the same thing goes with copyrights. On the other hand, there is also an argument against them. In the case of patents, some of the most important inventions and developments are not capable of being patented. One of the great inventions of the last few decades has been the supermarket. It has done an enormous amount to reduce the cost of distributing goods. Nobody could patent it. So the effect of their existing patent law tends to introduce a bias for inventive talent to be directed against in, in the direction of those items that can be patented, as opposed to those items that are not susceptible of being patented. In addition, it is possible to use patents to interfere with competition, patents that are really not just, not valid, not justified patents, but they can be a source of, of restricting competition, keeping other people out by uh, uh, all of the devices that have developed over the years, which you're much more competent than I am. In the same way with copyrights. There's an argument for a copyright on the ground that what a man writes is his property and you ought to be able to have the right to uh, 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 control it. There's an argument against it on the ground that, uh, that uh, you ought, after all, to make things available to people only on the, co on the basis of the extra cost of producing it. Now, interestingly enough, we have a good deal of experience of the absence of copyrights. There was a period of some 20 or 30 years in the 19th century when the U.S. did not join the International Copyright Convention, and essentially we operated without any copyrights. And it turned out to work very well, as a matter of fact. It turned out that the really successful authors really did even better because there was such an enormous premium on your being the first one to publish them. Because unless you got them out fast, the other people would copy you. So I don't know. Uh, on that issue, I really have very mixed feelings. I think there's a case against them. There's some case for them. I think it would take a much more expert knowledge than I have of the details of them to be able to come out with a flat answer with respect to them. I think, as I say, that I'm afraid we will have to call this off. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure to meet with you today.